world sharing this information. And what people have been asking us is to present what there is to come. And this is our first presentation on what there is to come. We've been following a schedule, and the schedule has been right on for 16.4 billion years. So here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. Here's Ian Lungold. Thank you. This is Maddie, by the way. Madeline. So, I'm going to start the proceedings the way that we traditionally start, and that is with words from the Hopi people, words from their ancestors passed down to us in these current days. There is a river flowing very fast. It is so swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel that they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has a destination. The elders say, we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves together, as we are tonight. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones who we were waiting for. A hope. Okay. I, I think the first fair question is to ask how all the people in in the crowd, how many of you have been to one of these presentations before? Or more? <laughs> Man, am I glad to see that. Because for the last year and a half, I've been going over all the basics and the basics. And now it's time to start bringing the Mayan calendar to your breakfast table. We have things going on in our environment and in our economies and society which have a lot to do with the Mayan calendar and what it says is supposed to be happening right now. So I am prepared to go over the basics for those people who haven't ever seen it before. But I'm going to go through this at a rip, roar, and pace. We're going to be running through this to get to the other information. So if you think this is a little sketchy at the beginning, uh, there's lots of information. There's tapes available to give you more detail on what we're going to be going through. And there, of course, is the book. Dr. Carl Jahan Kalaman is a biochemical engineer from Sweden, and he has written this book. Uh, after seven years of clinical research into the Mayan calendar. What he has in this book would take me a week of a course to train you in. I'm not going to try to do that. This has got all of the data and facts and background information to back up what we're going to be going over tonight. Then there's this. This is a tool that I invented some years ago. It's a perpetual daily Mayan calendar. It has very simple graphs or charts here that convert the Gregorian calendar to the Mayan calendar so you can find out what the day is on the Mayan calendar. Today is five monkey, by the way. You can find out what the day is and what that day means 
according to the Mayan calendar and what the intent of the day is on to creation, which gets quite personal as you go through this and, and get in line with it. Okay. been to our talks in the past, you know that there's one statement I make, it's that what I believe is the basic law of the universe, and that is what you pay attention to, you become conscious of. And it doesn't matter how highly evolved spiritually you are or not. What a great Swami pays, pays attention to he becomes conscious of. The more often or the most closely you pay attention, the more conscious of that thing you become. Which is one of the reasons to come and hear this information over and over again. We are starting with th this talk about consciousness. And consciousness needs a definition for this evening at least because there's lots of them that people use. My preference for the definition of consciousness is the awareness of being aware. In whatever state you are aware of it, the awareness of being aware is the essence of consciousness. That's what we're really talking about. Consciousness. and calendars. What is a calendar? A calendar is an agreement of a society or civilization on what time it is. It's actually the dead center of any civilization or any group consciousness. It's where everything happens in regards or in relation to. In our, in our society, what we have as far as an agreement about time is a thing called the Gregorian calendar. We'll talk very briefly about that later. But your consciousness always has a location. Always. Like this, your consciousness has a bullseye, a place in time and place and orientation. Your consciousness is oriented to time and place. Now these things are considerations, shared agreements, shared, shared thoughts with other people. It is this point right here that is the, the location of your viewpoint. You've each got one, a viewpoint, and it's yours and no one else can have it. You built it by all your decisions of time and place, time and place. You have established the content of your viewpoint. We're going to be hopefully expanding or feeding this viewpoint so that you can have other more orientation. But right now, our calendar, the agreement on what time it is, you can see how integral that is to the consciousness of a civilization as well as an individual. Our, our Gregorian calendar works in reference to the sun. Here's, here's 
the Gregorian calendar. And it works like this. There's our sun, and here's us, Earth. And we go around the sun every 365 and one quarter days. This is the Gregorian calendar. This is also the focus of our civilization's consciousness. In fact, our definition of time as a people is physical motion through space equals time. To be brief, the whole focus of our civilization is only on physical evidence. Now, some of us may disagree a little, but I'm talking about the focus of our civilization. Not the individuals. You know what I'm, the difference? What I'm talking about? Some people are on different levels of consciousness, but as an overall whole, Western civilization especially is concentrated on just physical. Not all calendars are that way. The Mayan calendar is an outstanding example of not being oriented to physical motion. The Mayan calendars were sacred. In fact, the Gregorian calendar was sacred. It was put in by Pope Gregory. At the beginning, people called it the year of our Lord. It was all sacred. But having to focus on material rather than anything immaterial, that meaning eroded away. Maya had two calendars, the Zolkin, which was the personal calendar for the astrological calendar of the Maya. This calendar is 260 days long. There are no moons or planets or anything else moving around the sun every 260 days. So this calendar was not timing any orbits of any planets. The Tune calendar is a 360 day calendar. The Tune calendar was the divine calendar or prophetic calendar of the Maya. And all the carved dates, all the dates carved in stone all over Mesoamerica are carved in tunes, not 365-day cycles. They're all carved in how many periods of 360 days have passed. The calendars work together. Like two years. These are each a day, and there's 360 of them in one round. And here, there are 260 teams. Now, each one of those days has a very specific spiritual meaning. The Mayan calendar and this tool that I've produced actually explains all those sacred meanings every day. <clears throat> but this cycle, going around, turns this one. There are no planets or moons going around in our solar system every 360 days around the sun. So this calendar as well was not keeping track of any physical motion. What were these guys timing? That's the big mystery that Mr. Coleman and myself have helped solve. Well, and everybody else that came up with scientific facts and breakthroughs along the way. Here's what they were timing. This is what kind of looks like a pyramid. 
It's a graphical display of a calendar stone at the mile left in a city called Koba some 2,500 years ago. They carved periods of time that represented the stages of the calendar, of the Mayan calendar. And each one of these nine levels is further divided into 13 sections. Can you see those on the bottom? 13 sections. They go in days and nights. That means there's seven days and six nights to each level of creation. We've heard that one somewhere before. Seven days. This first cycle began 16.4 billion years ago. This is called the cellular cycle. The cellular cycle, because way over here, in that magical 13th section, which is actually 1.26 billion years long, we're still living in that 1.26 billion years. Everything that's happened, of course, all of human history has happened in the very last, later sections of that 1.26 billion years. What happened right here, though, was the first form of cellular life. There were bacteria and viruses before, but there were the cells. The very next stage of creation started 820 million years ago. This is carved in a rock in the Yucatan Peninsula by the Maya. They said that the next stage in consciousness started here. And life sciences will tell you that this is when animals first appeared. Not animals with four legs but multicellular groups of cells working in cooperation for survival. The first multicellular organisms started right here. And evolution, going through these 1 through 13, made change after change after change to produce men. As a matter of fact, each one of these stages is 63 and a half, approximately, million years long. Each one of those 1 through 13 is 63.5 million years long. Coincidentally, life sciences find that there are major jumps forward in the structure and function of of consciousness in animals every 63.5 years, or million years. Here, this one is 41 million years ago. It's called the familiar, or familial cycle. This was another stage of consciousness where over 41 million years, consciousness built the relationship of family. We'll go through this just really quick, uh, the different kinds of consciousness that were the result of this. Each day and night, each one of these 13 was 3.2 million years long. Two million years ago, we started building a tribal consciousness. This is where cells group together for survival in this stage and further develop. Then, then there were a, a further organization of organisms into family groups. Then these family groups organized into tribes.
every 160,000 years was one of these steps. The cultural stage started 102,000 years ago. This, by the way, is when we learn to speak with one another. Each day and night was 8,000 years long. The national section started 3115 BC. This is the birthday of Egypt. It's also the birthday of writing. It's also the beginning of the age of bronze. Every 394 years was one of these steps of 1 through 13. The planetary section started in 1755. And this whole section went through its stages every 19.7 years. The galactic cycle January 5th, 1999. And in case you haven't noticed, things are changing quicker. In fact, we go through one of those days and nights every 360 days. The same amount of change that happened over 1.26 billion years at the beginning of this, now happens in every 360 days. There is a dramatic acceleration going on here, folks. Universal consciousness. February 10th, 2011, we start this consciousness cycle. And during that cycle, the same amount of change that is taking place in a year, I mean, in 360 days, will happen in 20 days. And it will get much faster than that. That's how fast it is when it starts. And it goes faster and faster. Just like this cycle is going faster and faster. But the most important thing is to know where we're going. Especially if you're going faster and faster. Isn't it? Okay, well kind of to figure out where you're going, sometimes you look at where you've been. If you've already gone through Galveston, then you know you're not going to Galveston. And let's go through this consciousness cycle, these different kinds, different kinds of consciousness that happen in these different cycles. Down here in the very beginning, this was all just action, reaction. Just action and then reaction. No thinking about it. That was the level of consciousness. If you drop a ball, it bounces. Heat and chemical bonds or 
or this debondings happen at certain times. Action, reaction. That was the level of consciousness that happened over and over again, developing and developing until it actually produced the miracle of life. Then, the miracle of life, that state of consciousness became stimulus response. Stimulus response as opposed to action reaction. It's a higher evolved means of dealing with the environment. And it took some 820 million years to develop it. Here, we went into individual stimulus and response. Or stimulus individual response. Where here, things were grouped together as nests, hives, flocks, schools, herds. The whole body responded as one. Here, though, came the concept of individual. And it is that concept that allows you to have a family relationship rather than just being one of the pack or one of the hive. There is an interpersonal communication and relationship between individuals. This is a huge step for consciousness. <coughs> In this cycle, we started being able to see similarities and differences. This is the purpose of your mind, to look at similarities and differences and come up with decisions about your future. And that has been developed over the last two million years. In the cultural stage, consciousness started coming up with reasons. Reasons for things to exist. Why is there rain? What are the stars? What is fire? These things are reasons. That became cosmology and shamanism and eventually religion and priesthoods. But it started 102,000 years ago, us coming up with reasons for that. In the national section, consciousness moved into laws and punishment. As a stage of consciousness. You've all heard the story of Adam and Eve. You guys know about when that story took place, according to the Hebrew Bible? Just about 60 years after this started. The whole idea of right and wrong, good and bad, was achieved during this period. Before that, there were only reasons things happened. There were superstitions, but there wasn't, there were suggestions, but there wasn't a line of dividing good and evil, right and wrong. It was during this period that laws came to be. Here, in the planetary cycle, consciousness was aimed primarily at one thing, power. Power and more power. Power to manipulate the environment. During this last section of the national cycle, we started discovering the laws of nature and harnessing those to supply us with more energy for more power. Back here in 1755, a man with 25 horses was a powerful individual. But each one of you rode over here in a carriage with some 180 horses pulling it. We each have a lot more power. Knowledge is power. You can go on the internet like I did today and look up absolutely anything you're curious about. You can know miracles. 
Imagine a person, an educated person, in 1755. Medicine was a primitive art. There was no science attached to it. There was no higher learning. Not in any context as we have now. We have a lot more power at our disposal. Thanks to this last 257 years. But power is not the end of the game, not evidently. There's a new kid on the block, a new consciousness that entered on January 5th, 1999. And that consciousness is of ethics. Now, a lot of people have ethics and morals kind of put together in the same soup. They're not really. Morals are a cultural thing. Morals are legislated by laws. Ethics is something which is deeply personal. Ethics is basically knowing the right thing to do and doing it. There's lots of things that are somehow moral, but not exactly ethical. Ethics is a refined consciousness. We'll be talking more about this because what we're going through right now is an evolution from some of these consciousnesses into higher consciousnesses. It's not always been an easy thing in the past, and we shouldn't really expect it to be so easy now. Although our understanding will help tremendously. The universal consciousness Universal consciousness that we will arrive at completely by October 28, 2011, is the consciousness of consciously co creating. Consciously co creating your very experience. I want that to sink in just a little bit so you got kind of an idea of how much we have to evolve, or don't have to, how much we're given the opportunity to evolve in a very, very short period of time. Right now, consciousness on Earth is sort of semi-conscious, wouldn't you say? I mean, for sure, it's a co-creation. Our reality is a co-creation. Everybody, with all their points of view, are adding to this whether they know it or not. And most don't. Most folks don't understand that they're not a victim. That they're actually participating in this co-creation. There's some of us who have a pretty bright glimmer of it every once in a while, right? That we're consciously co-creating? Haven't you noticed more and more of what you intend coming about one way or another? I know that I have, and I know that many people that I talk to, friends, that I have come up to me and said, my God, things are manifesting so fast. I was just thinking about such and such, and now it's in my life. Conscious co-creation is being spoon-fed to us. And people are waking up in droves everywhere to this fact. But we're going to be talking about the actual stages we'll go through, this 1 through 13. We're going to go through this and show you where and when the stages are. 
So, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening right now in our social, political arenas in the world. Primarily, there are certain kinds of consciousness which are sort of like a dead weight, dragging things down, need to be overcome to move on to higher and higher states of consciousness. One of those is this cultural consciousness down here. We as humanity pretty much have gotten over tribal consciousness and having to go, uh, having to belong to a small group of people. Now we have much larger vistas of consciousness. The cultural one is, is always a set of beliefs. I mean, they're the reasons people are living. Like there's certain folks who are living to be Israel or Israelis. And there are other people who are living to be Palestinians or Hindus or Muslims. Which is okay unless you think that this is the most important thing. If you think that Muslimism is the most important thing and all other religions, faiths, or sciences are bunk, then this cultural belief is in your way. If you believe that you have to be Protestant or you have to be Catholic in order to be right, that's limiting and in the way. And those viewpoints, frankly, are now going extinct. That way of looking at things just won't fly anymore. Now, as this, as the grip on people's consciousness starts to slip away from those empowered in the cultures, they will get a little bit more frantic. I mean, just think about anything suffocating to death, and you'll see what these folks are going through. There is no way out if you think you're the only one. That includes me. The national laws and punishment fight and die for country. That whole idea is dying, isn't it? You watch the news? Anybody admit to watching the news? <laughs> well, I understand not watching the news. But I don't know how you could possibly help but hear all the hue and cry over whether it's right to go murder innocents in Iraq for our principle and, uh, or not. There is a huge debate going on right now on whether it's right to defend the nation against any and all possible threat as though the nation was the most important thing in anyone's life or on the planet. America is America. It's a plot of ground. It's no more important than Africa or Asia. It's all part of a planetary body. We have no more privilege or should have no more privilege than anyone else on Earth. And the whole idea that we have to go defend our privilege is dying, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> this can be a two-way deal, by the way. I'm not up here just to lecture. I don't like that. <clears throat> the whole idea of nationalism is going extinct. Makes sense. We have a planetary economy. We have planetary communications. Borders are getting less and less important. So the whole these people 
that are locked into, or that consciousness which is locked into the narrow view of love it or leave it, whether it's Alberta or America, those people are going to be moved one way or another. It happened to the dinosaurs down here. It happened to, it actually happened to the Neanderthals right there. And here, this planetary cycle, we're all riding the crest, riding in the first car of the power train. All over the world. We got Bush, he's up there stoking the coal into the engine. And all of us, public, not part of the government, but all this public are riding in the first car. It's a nice car. Leather seats, frilly cushions, curtains, drinks served by the minute. This train's got a lot of power behind it. We're trying to show it to the world right now. But you know what? Ethics and power at the beginning are diametrically opposed. Remember those old movies, beginning of movies that were still like flickery, you know? And they had two engines, two big steam locomotives, one on the track over here and one on the track over They made them run as fast as they could at one another. Did you ever see those newsreels? Come on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. You can hear me, I can't hear you. That's what's going on right now. Right as we speak, there is this powertrain which is running as fast as it can. And then on the tracks, coming the other direction, is ethics. Have you noticed any of that in the news? You see, these different stages, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, because you want to know when this is going to happen. We'll talk about more of that in detail, but I wanted you to get the idea a train wreck happens really fast, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you know, we are going so fast, our consciousness is going so fast, that the way we see this train wreck is in super, super, super slow motion. <laughs> what happened just a little while ago? is that we went through the, the midnight of a, the fourth stage down there. Now, what always happens during the fourth stage is that diametric points of view come together. And I'll show you some of that in a little bit. But they come together. And on June 17th, which was right there, June 17th of this cycle, the cow catchers touched. The cow catcher of the powertrain and the cow catcher of the ethics engine touched. The impact really began. You know what happened on that day? No. Worldcom. All of a sudden, what might have been a little problem with Enron, <laughs> blossomed into a uh-oh, and we're still going, oh, I don't want to see. I don't even want to know. I'm not even going to watch the news. Sorry, folks, it's coming anyway. It's a lot better to be informed. So what we're seeing here is this powertrain, and we're going to watch as the headlight caves in, and the plates start to buckle, 
and the pipe's springing, steam is spilling, and the boiler is going to burst. And the tracks, the wheels are going to leave the track completely on this power train. Now, this is not me doing this, no more than I killed all the dinosaurs. This isn't, this isn't anything personal. This is a process. And this is a real serious deal. It's also going to be lots of fun. Because there's, actually, I'm kind of making suspenseful, but there's more good happening than bad. All that's going to happen is all the people on the power train are going to get pretty roughed up. But there's lots of other good things. This ethical consciousness must be in place before we can go into conscious co-creation. Frankly, do you trust your neighbor to be able to create anything he wanted in your backyard? <laughs> We're just not there yet. You guys have seen this snowman type thing before, but this is a, a diagram of what's kind of happening in our, in our time space. In the past, there was only so much happening in any moment. Let's say it was three things. It could happen to you or for you in any moment. That is, it could be something good for you, something bad for you, and something kind of down the middle. And it was your job to pick out a, a, a direction, pick an opportunity, take it, and see what happens. Say this one to your goal. Okay. Take this one to your goal just because. It looks like it's the closest. Now, in the present, there's more happening in every moment. There's more opportunities open and available to you than there were to any other part of humanity. If you doubt it, go try to order a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It's not just coffee, tea, or cream, sugar, or black anymore. Now, you have lots and lots of opportunity. You vegetarians from 25 years ago, look at the variety you have now of what to eat as opposed to then. There are more and more and more options in your life. That's because creation is speeding up, presenting more and more opportunities in every moment. It's compacting. This will continue all the way to where it's totally possible for you to consciously co-create absolutely any reality you could possibly imagine. And you will have a wonderful imagination by that time. In the present, there's more and more going on. From the past, from the view of the past, we're living as wizards. From just like 180 years ago, you people are all wizards for just, just the fact that you're sitting there. How do you get here this fast? Where's your horse? Because back then, a horse was about the fastest thing going. So, in the future, here it is, future truths come forward during the third day. In a plant, what we have is 
the first couple of sets of leaves have fallen off now, and now we have permanent leaves that will eventually become branches of a tree. And the root system is more fully developed. It's reaching down to establish itself in water. The truth comes out during the third day. Ian, say where we are now, please. And where we are right now is in, we're at the very end of this second night. This is where we are. Right there. The second night ends on December 14th. 2002, and it runs, this runs through most of 2003. <laughs> what we can expect here is all the truth. I don't think, how many people out there think you've heard all the truth about our governments, our systems, about religion? About, how many people out there think that you've heard all, really? Well, we're going to hear a lot more than we want to. Yay. Yeah, yay. Because you can't deal with the situation until you know the situation. And that's what this is all about. That's what this section is all about. Life made a burst during this period of time. And what it was headed for is over here. Fishes. A spine and a whole new way of living. Through the application of the truth, which in this case was that multicellular organisms are more survival than, than anything else, than individuals. From the application of that truth, we got more evolution. And we're right over here, the new <coughs> foundation. New procedures. This is the God of Rain. It's in the fourth day. Very important things happen during the fourth day. For one, the invention of the spine. Fishes. Then we had the first Olympics and Homer and the telephone. All of these firsts and all of these developments, new systems new foundations of consciousness happened during this fourth day. During the fourth night, actually this was the end of Greece. What's during the fourth night? The nights are times of application, but they're not so gentle in a lot of cases. Here, we have the fifth day. Now the fifth day is all about a huge breakthrough in consciousness. It's also ruled by the god of fire. In a plant's light, after it's gone through all this development, then it starts to put out certain chemicals, amino acids, to change the structure of the plant, or the purpose of the plant, to start it on its road to procreation, to being sexual. Some of the things that happened during the fifth day, well, there was a transition to land, That was a pretty major move. Then there was color vision. Then there was this in 
invention of fire, or the control of fire. Then there was art, the development of art, first art found. Then there was Christ himself. And then, way down here, EMC squared and the invention of radio. <clears throat> All those sorts of things happened during the fifth age. Those are pretty major advancements. Transition to land, color vision, fire, art, Christ consciousness, E equals MC squared, and a way to communicate, radio, which changed people's consciousness and sped it up some more. Down here, in the fifth day, or fifth night, excuse me, fifth night, we had, I'll just go through this, World War II and atomic bombs. Bombs. This is like ruled by death, the god of death. Makes sense, huh? What it's actually talking about is death of old consciousness. right during that period of time. As a matter of fact, many things have gone extinct during this period of time, including the Neanderthals. The dinosaurs went extinct over here in the sixth night. But many things have passed away that were of no positive purpose for the evolution of consciousness. And what we're coming up on is this third day is going to expose truths which most folks won't be pleased with. There's a reason that there's so much hunger and starvation and misery in the world. And it's, the reason has been hidden behind cultural and national ideas. What's the most popular form of hiding the truth from us now? National security. Hiding behind, or hiding with those consciousnesses is stopping the forward of evolution of consciousness. That's going to disintegrate. Uh, not because of any political pressure, because of the creation, because of creation's intention. Creation is forcing this to occur. And it's forcing ethics to be the primary consideration. Right now, most people would not invest in any company that couldn't prove they had integrity. Anyone who can't pass that ethical or integrity test is going to go out of business. And there's nothing that any of them can do about it, except get in line. <laughs> That's going to happen to every aspect of your lives, and all of your neighbors, too. Whether they're conscious, thinking about this, worrying about this, or exulting over it, it's going to happen. So you might as well exult over it. <laughs> because where this is leading is more and more fun. Now, I wonder if, you know, sometimes, I mean, some of you guys went and listened to me do this whole talk about the different disasters that have happened in history. And there were bad things that happened. Meteor bombardments, ice ages, you know, big extinctions, all of them happening right here in this fifth night. But if you remember, I went all the way up to World War II. And World War II is not the same kind of consequence as 200 million years of meteor bombardment. Things are getting better, folks. They really, really are. You know, we complain about animals not having enough rights. Women, hey, 120 years ago, you were challenged. You had no rights. 
We have raised the bar so high on what we expect as an ethical and integral lifestyle that massive things have to change in order for things to match our expectation. That's why it kind of looks like things aren't so good. Because our expectations are so high. They should be. But if you look and get better perspective, we're all living almost twice as long as people did 80 years ago. Eating far better, clothed far better, entertained up the, you know, we've got entertainment. Things are getting, going to be very, very interesting. Here, during the application of the truth, now this is the part that we got to really look out for. Doing this right here, some people's going to go nuts. As the truth comes out of how much betrayal there has been, some people just not going to take it very easy. And then there's all those who are going to frantically be protecting themselves against all the truth. You can already see it, can't you? Well, this is the time period right here. This is December 9th in 2003 through December 4th, 2004. Well, let's be really happy that these are only 360 day periods. <laughs> Rather than, like last time around, it was 20 year periods. It took a long time to get over it. Now we've got a lot more momentum, and we're going to be flying through this. Of course, uh, if there's any resistance, guess what? You impact that resistance. If you put resistance in front of this motion, and that is resistance of your own unwillingness to change, you are going to get squished. This application of the truth is going to be kind of tumultuous. This was, in the Greek times, this was the dark ages. Right here. Right over here, oh, excuse me, the fourth day. Anybody here heard of Nassau? Can anybody speak about it? I can, because I'm not part of the programs. Nassara is the National Economic Security and Recovery Act. Nassara is a secret law. It has been passed at least three times by Congress, signed by the President many times, by which all of them must abide by the world court decision that they must all resign. The whole government must resign. And there must be a complete revamp of our banking and economic system. Because thanks to Willie Nelson, and farm aid, the IRS and the federal bureaus were found to be fraudulent and guilty of treason against all of you. And so Nassara, which is a radical law, radical, complete new foundation for the ethical and integral operation of business, individual, and government alike. It's been scheduled on the books for quite a while. For the last, last three years, it's been in development. It's actually been a law for over a year now, but not enacted. It was supposed to be enacted on September 11th. But we had an accident. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, 
So this new foundation, this new structure for having an ethical government, an ethical economic system, is in, in place. It's up here. It was, it was right in here. It was being developed, being germinated, sprouting. Going to Congress and getting passed a couple of times. Now it's being talked about more and more and more by people like me and on the internet. And as this truth is exposed, so will the truth about a new foundation be exposed. It will be fully implemented or put into effect during this time, according to the Mayan calendar during the fourth day. This, this is November of 2005. We start the fourth night. The fourth night is always a time of the application on the, the beginning of building new structure on the new foundation. It's ruled by the god of intoxication. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. It's a pretty giddy time. Right here. It's a time of healing. After these shifts and changes, it's like a respite during that period of time. But then preparation for huge breakthroughs in consciousness. Now, we have a fifth day coming up in 2006 through 2007. During the national cycle, Christ showed up right here and gave us the consciousness that we were divine. We were every bit as divine as the kings and rulers of Rome. That we didn't have to have any particular priests or kings speaking to our Creator for us. That's what Christ brought in, is that we're all sons and daughters of God. Then, during the most recent fifth day, we got E equals MC squared, the blueprint of our physical reality. Another guy, Hubble, discovered that we lived in an infinite universe, which means that everything is possible. So during this period of time, we got the blueprint and the proof that absolutely anything and everything is possible to occur. That's a big opening for consciousness. What do you suppose this one's going to be? We're already doing teleportation. You're already experiencing telepathy daily. What kind of breakthroughs do you suppose we're going to have by 2006? Do you know that they're working on nanocomputers right now? A nano is a part of an electron, by the way. They're now able to program nanos in order to create molecular-sized computers. When you team that up with the ability to, tr to teleport light, you get something which is way beyond our comprehension of computers right now. Infinitely fast computers that are nearly infinitely small. That we're working on right now. Funny thing. The development is happening way faster than they thought. <clears throat> These scientists in Denmark are decades ahead of where they thought they would be. These scientists 
and Denmark are decades ahead of where they thought they would be five years ago. They are already 25 years ahead of where they thought they'd be in five years. What does that mean? More and more is possible. Genetics. You know that they just recently did the whole map of the human gene, the, the genome, right? We have all the human DNA. You probably also heard that that happened 15 years ahead of schedule. This acceleration is for real, folks. Huge corporations are teetering and teetering and going to fall over. And it's not so much because of their ethics, although that's a big part of it right now. Research and development is the most expensive part of business. And by the time somebody has gone through the whole process of research and delivered the product to market, it's already extinct. And they have to nearly give it away. The companies can't keep up with the rate of the acceleration of consciousness because they're dealing in physical stuff. Consciousness is not physical. The possibilities in consciousness are not limited by time and space. And that, that limit of time and space is becoming less and less and less there. I want to do something with you. I want to go through this. This right here, I want to go through this about money. I mean, money's a big deal, right? All of us. I know money's a big deal to me. Oh. Here we go. Down here, what was money? Money was sharp pointy sticks and rocks. So, you know, some hank of hair tying a rock on to make it a tool, that was exchangeable. So the medium of exchange was rocks and sharp pointy sticks. Here, we go up to cultural, and what we got is an exchange of prettier rocks. That is, gold and silver, and some gems. We go up here into national, and the national consciousness, we get paper money and a banking system. Paper money. Right here, during this whole thing, we built an economy of electrons. That plastic card in your back pocket, that's a bank of electrons and nothing else. You know what has happened to the medium of exchange? It's gotten less and less physical, hasn't it? Electrons are just mental. Watch the stock market. It goes up and down with how people are thinking about it. It's all electrons. 80% of all commerce is done electronically, not with cash. So what's the next step? We have more steps here. What is going to be the medium of exchange in the future? No. It, oh, it'll still be there. But it, there is an evolution going on here. We use gold already, okay? We had that as one. We've gone from a physical medium of exchange to less physical, to less physical, now a mental medium of exchange. What's the next level? Spiritual exchange. And there's only one thing that spirits exchange. Admiration. They exchange particles of admiration. You can call it lots of different things. You can call it the emotion love. But what they're really doing, bottom line, is they're flowing admiration, which is all you were ever doing. 
how many boxes of berries is that blanket worth? As much as you admire it. How many electrons is that Corvette worth? As much as you admire it. And if you don't admire it enough, then you're going to buy a pickup truck or a Volkswagen or something else. The true value of anything to everyone is how much they admire it. And that will be the next step in our economics. How valuable is a company on Wall Street right now? How much do you admire Worldcom? So what's going to be valuable in the future? And what should you be investing in? What is admirable and nothing else? Now, if you find gold admirable, there you go, lots of people do. But you know what's going to be more admirable than anything? Your consciousness. Your truth, your ethics, and your integrity. Those are what will sustain you through any and all of these changes. In fact, will buoy you up so that you're not suffering through this process. Because it's those people who have their integrity, who have the courage the ethics to go ahead and create for yourself what you wish to experience. It's those people with integrity who will be able to take advantage of the opportunities presented by creation. And those people who do not have integrity, those people who are having to hide behind something or resist something or another, will bring upon themselves what their consciousness is focused on, their own fear. <clears throat> and their own judgment. And that's a bitch, ain't it? <laughs> that's what's going to happen down here for sure. You heard of Judgment Day? Well, all of this is decision time. All this is an opportunity for you to look at how things are going and make up your mind. Am I going to stay on this power train or I'm jumping off now? What? Am I going to get more ethical and more follow my own integrity or am I going to go and just hunt down that dollar? So, <clears throat> down here, by this period of time, those points of view or those consciousnesses that could not keep up with creation are extinguished. Right here. They're done. They're gone. And creation is on to new things. As a matter of fact, this is the flower. This is puberty, by the way. <laughs> Remember puberty? <laughs> It wasn't so easy, was it? It was exciting, but it wasn't so easy. There was all this change going on. I'm supposed to be like this. No, I'm not. Well, <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that all the consciousness will be going through during this period. Here, though, is adolescence. Here's where um, you probably got laid. <laughs> It was all over the floor all of a sudden. <laughs> this is, well, this is when flowers, flowers are certainly having sex with birds and bees right here. And right in this period of time, there's some very wonderful things that have happened historically. Like the Renaissance in France happened during this period of time. And um, the flower children, remember flower children? <laughs> This is called...
This is called Renaissance. And it's ruled by the god of flowers. <clears throat> this is also, during, the, during this time, this is where King Arthur and the Round Table were around. Right here. Also, the Anasazi, the civilization of the Anasazi, this is their golden time, right here. During the sixth day was the flower of their civilization. And the Maya as well. This is when they flowered. What happens to flowers? Hmm? They die to become seed pods for a fruit, which is a seed, a seed pod. And this development during the sixth night is when the seed pod dries up and then it springs out all the seeds during the seventh day. What's going to happen here is that after this breakthrough of consciousness, after all the decision has been made on whether you are going to be part of this evolution or not, from that point on, there's no more anchor. No more this can't happen. No more this you can't do this. In fact, at this point right here, the idea of having control over any other person will be the same kind of idea as having your neighbor's kid for dinner. I mean, cooking them. <laughs> it would be this, the idea of having control over somebody else will be as foreign or adverse as that concept. And it's only from there that we can meet the neighbors. You see, we're under galactic quarantine until we get to a certain stage of ethical conduct and considerations. They can't get to us either. It's not just us on this planet, you understand? Everything in 3D, I mean the whole universe, the whole third dimensional universe is going through this at the same time. Other dimensions, more than likely, have already gone through this. It's our turn. No one else on any other planet can get to us, and we can't get to them. Because we're separated, on purpose, through the plan. You have to be ethical before you make that contact. It's sort of like you got to be 16 before you can get a driver's license. <clears throat> Here, technology will go extinct. For all intent and purposes, spirit will take over 100%. There won't be any sickness. There won't be any lack or hunger because spirit will be handling it all. Consciousness is already creating this whole experience. We're just not creating it as consciously as we wish. By this time, we will have all the consciousness, and a lot of consciousness, and be experiencing things much more rapidly. Knowledge and wisdom are two different things. You can know something, but once you actually use the knowledge, then you get wisdom. Some things don't work. Now you know. <laughs> We're going to be going through that about creating stuff, stretching our wings. Growing our wings. During this sixth night, by this time, the only thing that really would be 
plan is the word bliss. For that 360 day period, there is going to be such a celebration of liberation and experimentation, <clears throat> getting ready for the completion. Here we have healing. The God of medicine, right there. And this is completion. The God of manifestation. Now, <clears throat> this seventh day, this seventh day starts in, uh, let's see, we go 2006, seven, sorry, 2008, this is 2009, this is 2010, through to 2011. 2011, okay. There we go. I like that better. 2010. <clears throat> By the time we get to 2009, we will be in, uh, we won't necessarily be here. Because by that time, we'll have met the neighbors. And we'll be using their teleportation device to go over to visit them and then to us and back and forth. Anywhere you want to be. Anywhere. Star Trek will be like kindergarten. It better be for real. <clears throat> Here, we enter into the universal cycle. The universal cycle is the last 260 days of this 360 day period. So it's about, about that much of it. And it's during that last little section, that universal cycle, that we are supposed to get up to speed to experience absolutely all of infinity within our consciousness. Now, if that doesn't fit in your brain, I understand. It, it's really not supposed to. Not yet. We have a lot of change to go through. But most of it is some really fun stuff. Would you like to be out of debt and never ever be in debt again? That's part of the song. Would you like to have a different kind of economy where there's only abundance rather than controlled lack? That's part of the application of these systems. Would you like to have the knowledge, that the absolutely confirmed knowledge that you're divine and that everything is possible with demonstrations from other civilizations of other things that we never conceived of that are possible? That's what will happen right here. Would you like to have all of the the, ab the complete abolition of any limit, of any consideration, yes. that's what happens right here. Technology is a ladder to get up, you know, further and further in consciousness. The reason you guys are experiencing telepathy is because of the internet and the telephone. Your consciousness expects to be in instant communication, and so it is. Technology is a ladder. Technology is the footprint of consciousness. But technology is going to be outpaced by consciousness right here. Then we go into, I don't know what to call it, exactly. Bliss. You know, a running start at becoming God. Aren't 
aren't you already up to it? <laughs> we just got to get all this junk off our backs. By the way, has anybody, uh, anybody noticed, I mean, has anybody had this feeling that stuff is falling off of you? Yes. Yes. Maybe uh, jobs, <laughs> positions, uh, identities, spouses. Yes. Uh, it, stuff is just falling off. Happened to me just a couple of weeks ago, big time. Yay! I was upset at the moment. <laughs> this is this process that we're all going through. Down here, you ever heard of the eye of the needle? There it is. <laughs> there it is, right there. October 28, 2011. Eye of the needle. And the camel doesn't get through the eye of the needle. You know where that story came from, right? Uh, in ancient cities, on the camel routes, the, uh, there were lots of robbers and, and thieves and armies, and so they built the walls really big and thick and tall, and all of the doorways narrow, so that people could just charge in. So when the camel trains came, loaded, the camels loaded down, they had to unload the camel to get it through the eye of the needle. That's what's happening to all of us. We're getting unloaded. But some of the things that you're going to get unloaded from are pretty personal. Like who you thought you were. Some guys that are working in uh, industries right now are finding out that they're not a machinist. They're not a computer specialist. People are finding out more and more what they are not. Maybe this has got something to do with the progression or the evolution of consciousness. We've come a long ways by asking the questions, who are we and what are we doing here? I think it's time to start asking a new question. What am I not? I'm not my house. I'm not my second car. Now I'm not even my first car. I'm not my relationships. Lots of people are going to be finding that out either gently or not so gently. Eventually we'll find out that indeed we are nothing. We are no thing. At which point it's pretty easy to go through the eye of a needle. So that's pretty much what is coming down from the Mayan perspective, from what this schedule shows and has shown us, this pattern is shown over and over again. What I'd like to do, what I really want, is I want questions. Do you guys have some questions? I cannot have explained the whole universe in two hours. Yes. about raising uh, vibrations to where you can change the cellular makeup of the body? Well, uh, actually, that all comes under more as possible. What you pay attention to, you become conscious of, period. So if you pay attention to raising the cellular vibration in your body, then that indeed is what will occur. Just like if you pay attention to how much toothpaste you put on the tube, you're not going to waste it. I mean, it's that literal, folks. And what has been the problem in the past is that most folks didn't believe that. And this is a co-creation. 
the more people think they're disempowered, the more of a drag it is on everybody. And the more individuals empower themselves, the more it liberates or lightens the load on everybody. Creation is totally on our side. Totally. Notice, there are seven days and only six nights. The deck is stacked in our favor. There's more consciousness, more opening to consciousness than there is any difficulty. We go from a first day all the way to a seventh day and then go straight to a first day again. All of creation is on our side to further and further evolve consciousness into higher and more able states. <laughs> so, in eternity, infinity, well, right now, infinity is one of those concepts which escapes consciousness. I mean, when you get close to thinking about infinity, you're then thinking about it. Hmm? Over and over? Yes, higher and higher and higher till infinity. Till no ending. Which is, you won't be there yet. We'll be getting there, and getting there, and getting there. What we got through it is in 2011. October 28, 2011 is when consciousness is scheduled to experience absolutely everything, all at the same time. Some people, individuals, will be doing that beforehand, but all of creation will be there on that schedule. It's just like if two women get pregnant on the same day, they're going to have their babies at different times. It's a natural cycle. It's not something that's like a light switch clicked on and off. Yes? Yes, now what she just said was, in nine years, will all of the power system, all the corrupt politicians, all the drug lords, all the industrialists, will they be gone? Absolutely. By natural disaster and corporate suicide. They cannot keep pace with the changes. If they can't keep pace with the changes, they will be delim eliminated. They'll be gone. Oh, by the way, I didn't talk about the earth changes, did I? The poles. That's the truth. You're not told about it on CNN. But scientists know that this is the truth. You're going to get told about it because more and more drastic weather is going to be happening all over the planet during this next 360 day period. As the truth comes forward, whether you want to hear it or not. Then we have the application of the truth. The application of the truth is when the effects of the sun are going to boil over into earthquakes, volcanoes, typhoons, tsunamis, everything you can imagine. Drought. What? Drought. Drought? Doing it now. Drought is doing it now. This is a process. Like I said, a plant doesn't grow in stages, it grows through stages. This whole thing is doing the same, this whole process is doing the same thing. It's going through a natural change by degrees, but there are stages delineated. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put that down. So, what we have here is the majority of the earth changes, which is a good thing because that's the only thing that's going to stop people from fighting. You're going to need something bigger than armies to stop this one. And to stop it this quickly. Otherwise, i got lots of bombs to, show, to throw, you know, i got lots of, lots of missiles. We need something bigger, faster to stop it all, which is the natural disasters. Then we'll have whole new structures, whole new mountain ranges, for Christ's sake. 
new foundations. Now, I'm not saying that everything and everybody's going to die. I'm not saying that the earth is going to end. It's going to change dramatically. It's done it many times before on a slower process. But it's done it. Geologists, archaeologists, paleontologists, all of them know this is the truth. It's no legend that this place used to be underwater. It's not a legend. There are, you can go out and find shells in the cliffs. It's happened before. Now, where are you safe? Where could you possibly be safe? Only one place in your intuition. No matter where you are, it's your intuition that guides you. If you, for whatever reason, decide not to pay attention to your intuition, talk to some of the people who have gone through disasters and hear how they made it through. Did they stop to think about it? No. They moved and they moved and they kept moving and they didn't make decisions. They knew the right thing to do. And that got them through. That's going to be the procedure through this period of time. I think that you guys already have a jump start because you're here. What's so special about here? It's safe. Why is it safe? Well, there's an indication of why it's safe. The Hopi are right up there. <laughs> there are going to be places that aren't touched much. And there are going to be places that are completely flattened, obliterated, gone, and just trashed. Like any city, for instance. If not by the military and their actions, then by the coast, which is going to be shrinking some 60 feet over this the next few years. Because what you're not being told about global warming is that it's not your car. It's the sun. And there's nothing we can do about that. And if he decides to melt the, the glaciers again, which he's doing right now, and if he decides to do it quickly, which he is right now, then the water level is going to rise real fast. If you've got any coastal properties, sell. <laughs> but we're going through this elimination process to get to new foundations. Yes? When will our monetary system start to fall? When will our monetary system start to fall? Oh, you weren't invested in the stock market, I take it. <laughs> Where it will totally change is right here. During the fourth day, when the SARA is actually put in as a law, well, that starts December 4th, 2004. Right at the end of 2004 and all the way through 2005, until the very end of 2005, is when that'll, that is scheduled to be there. Now, what that entails is we will be going back to constitutional law. And to a treasury. The Federal Reserve will be liquidated, Yay. along with the IRS. Yay. Actually, the, uh, the IRS officially died on June 17th of 2002. It died when Bob Schultz delivered a letter, a very specific letter to the IRS declaring that he would never again file or pay income taxes for these particular reasons. 
and they are many, and they are things that are decided by the Supreme Court and other federal courts over the last few years. These things make the IRS completely fraudulent and a crime on the public. And these facts were entered into public record. So now they're your evidence too. And the IRS cannot prosecute anyone for not filing. They're dead. They had to go sometime. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the question was, it seems like ancient civilizations have higher consciousness than we do now. And um, I'm going to use a consciousness that, that is pretty, it's local, uh, the American Indians. Okay, the American Indians had a consciousness which some could say was higher than ours. Because they lived in harmony with nature. The Maya had a similar thing. They lived very much as one with creation. Sort of like what you were at four days old, six months old, 13 months old. You were suckling at your mother's breast. And your consciousness was very bright. But you were suckling and suckling. And what would have happened if you were never removed from your mother's breast. You wouldn't have evolved. What happened to the American Indians is basically everyone but the Hopi, and maybe the Anasazi before then, had a religion that nothing shall change. Tradition is everything. The ancestors are your lords, and you will live by these passed down tenants. Well, change came. And they were removed from the breast of Mother Nature. And they had a hissy fit for quite a few years. Now, their consciousness, the consciousness of the American Indian, is integrated itself into our society. Are they profiting? Most Indian tribesmen now are the most popular, most powerful men in their states. And in, in Canada, they are more powerful than a Canadian citizen. They have more volition. They're helping their people. They're educating themselves. And they're keeping track of a whole lot more than how many feathers are on that turkey or when are the cattle going to, when are the buffalo going to migrate through here? Their consciousness has sped to where it's now keeping up with creation. They adapted. They came on online. And they're doing a lot of good. I wanted to point out something about ethics and power. Right now, they're opposed. Ethics and power. Bam! It's a collision. Once the collision is over, by the way, the ethics train, not a thing, not a scratch is going to be on the ethics train. The power train is going to be laid in pieces everywhere. But, you know, you can't have ethics unless you have power. You can't be an assistance to the continued survival of anything unless you have some power. My definition of ethics is the deft application of power, using the right amount. Not too much, not too little. Using what is appropriate for the situation to benefit all. I mean, think about it. A piece of big old blob of kelp laying on the beach somewhere is not going to be able to affect the ethical situation on the
Why? It has no power. On the other hand, let's say that a major network, a major broadcast organization, decided that for their own survival, they had to become totally ethical and report only with integrity. Now suppose that happened. They already have the power, don't they? If it's applied in the right way, if it's applied in an appropriate fashion, they can make everything more ethical, everything more integral for all of us. This is going to happen. As a matter of fact, it already is. Watch the news. Don't watch the news for who died and who killed that person. Watch the news for what are these people presenting about ethics and integrity. And you will enjoy the show. Because you'll see more and more and more of it. And demands on everyone to be more in, more in ethics. Questions? More questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. What dimensions are you counting? What's that again? What dimensions are you counting? Oh, uh, what, okay. Counting? Only the third. The, the question was, which dimensions are we counting in this? Only the third dimension. This is only 3D. All of it, all of 3D, but only 3D. Other dimensions aren't part of this. Other dimensions don't have the limitation of time and space. Remember the location of your consciousness? Your, your considerations of time and place is where you're at? Other dimensions don't have that. That's a limitation. It's your subscription to 3D, like you would get a magazine. You know, you subscribe to, to popular science or field and stream. Well, we're subscribing our, to 3D. Another question? Hey. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, it's already happening. Um, right now, <clears throat> in 1999, we received an answer to a, a communication we sent out uh, in the, into the universe in 1974. Do you hear about that or you see that, that crop circle that's an answer? It's a digital printout of a binary code message that we sent out into space. Okay, happened in, in, in the year 2000 right here in the middle of, of the first day. Since then, we've gotten more and more communications. Communications that, frankly, can be ignored. If you don't want to pay attention to it, it's not a big deal. It's not like the aliens are putting up billboards on the side of the buildings. They're doing it on crops. And just recently, as a matter of fact, uh, in, yeah, the 15th, the 15th of this month, there was a huge picture of an alien and then a, a mandala type thing that was laid down on August 15th this year. Huge. It's on the internet. Go check it out. Uh, they are in communication right now, but in such a way as they can be totally ignored if you so desire. It's not intrusive. And I don't believe that these guys are from the other planets. I believe they're from other dimensions. Now, <clears throat> by the time we get through into here, down into, into this formation here, these new foundations are going to include embellishments on our ability to see and communicate with our neighbors. This, this is where we'll start to actually find other life on other planets, part of our new foundation of understanding. Then, during this period of time, 
or at, just after this period of time, is when we'll meet other galactic citizens. And it won't be long after that before we're meeting other citizens from other galaxies as well. That'll be down in here, when we surpass technology and we're way past, in consciousness, any of the limits of time and space, which is, what's the limit between us being here and being in a different galaxy? What's the only barrier? Your consideration that is impossible. That's the only barrier. Once that's gone, you can be there. So, right in here, 2006 to 2007, is when we'll actually be shaking hands with somebody from a different planet. Yes? actually occurs from here in a major way. What the question was, when do we go from third to fourth to fifth dimension? And from fifth, who knows? We're kind of in a bad perspective to learn higher dimensions. You know? It's way down here. It's like a little kid trying to see what's on top of the shelf, you know? You know something's up there, but you can't quite. <clears throat> from here, from here, our technological advances and our conscious advances will lead us to understand other dimensions, even if we can't get there. But from here on, from, from this place on, people will be flitting in and out of them until here, the, by the time we go through 2011, we'll have all that freedom for any of, for dimensions other than the third. We're already going through the fourth. The fourth dimension is time. And we're going through time right now. We're wasting time. We're just racing through it. More and more creation happening in less and less time. The space is a consideration that will fail right here. By the time we get down here, 2008, there will be a, so many holes punched through by consciousness into other dimensions, that the consideration that they don't exist will evaporate. It's sort of like Columbus wasn't the only person who thought the world was round. There were maps, for Christ's sake. He had one. He was following it. But most of the world thought the most of the people thought the world was flat. Until there were experiments and there were there were exhibitions and there were expeditions that came back alive and just blew holes in the fact that the Earth was flat. That's the same kind of thing that will be happening right here, during that sixth day. But it is not going to be an instant thing. It's not like you can just go in and punch into the fourth and fifth dimension, you know? It's not like that. It's a process. Another question? Well, the reason there's so many books out there about this is because, folks, this is a migration. Think of yourself as a big bull elk or something, you know? And it's time to go eat grass down in the valley. And we're all going that way. That's what's happening to consciousness. It's all moving, moving toward more and more possibility moving toward more and more personal responsibility, moving more and more and more to ethical and integral styles. Position. A lot of feminine power was removed by killing some four 
women for being witches. And your intuition was turned off. But as a matter of fact, you know what a gyroscope is? It's like that, right? It's a, a gyroscope that's got a thing like that. And here, this is a centering. That's a center, like the axle. You know, peace of mind, peace of mind, only comes when a person is centered. Is that right? Think about your own experience. When you were personally centered, you had peace of mind. Have you ever had peace of mind when you weren't centered? I doubt it. Centeredness is a pre prerequisite for having peace of mind. So how do you get centered? With certainty. When you're certain about something, then you're centered. If you're uncertain about something, then you're upset and not centered, right? So how does one get certainty? There's only one source, the recognition of patterns. When you recognize the pattern, now you're certain that it's going to happen again, or it will work this way. You learn to drive that way. When you first got behind the wheel, you didn't have peace of mind. You weren't centered. You weren't certain because you didn't know the patterns. Now you know the patterns of traffic and the habits, which are also patterns of stupid drivers. <laughs> so you can have more peace of mind behind the wheel. Now, this gyroscope has a center. But a gyroscope works on the principle of the more motion around that center, the more stable it is. Hmm. So as creation presents more and more change all around you, if you are stable, if you are centered, you're going to become more and more stable rather than more and more out of control. Does that make sense? So the more you recognize the pattern of creation and the pattern of all these changes, just from tonight's talk, I mean, okay, now we're almost to the stage right now. So let's say in December, just after the elections, well, actually, it's going to be during the elections and all the accusations and all the truth being splattered on each other. But then after that, all this torrent of truth starts coming out about things you wished you weren't hearing. You're going to remember this talk. And you're going to go, my God, this really is happening. I'm recognizing this pattern right now. And you know what? you'll have more peace of mind. Because this will already be starting to work. And the faster and the faster things change around you, the more stable you will get. The more empowered you will be to help others. And that's the real purpose for all this information. All those things get spun off real fast. <laughs> yeah. So you know what? I want to thank you all very much for coming. And next, I want to uh, make a, a request. 
And that is that if you found some value or some validity in your own experience to what we were talking about, please help us spread this information. This information is not going to do this little group of people any good whatsoever. As we watch everyone else go just off their nut, it won't be any fun at all. But if there's any way that you can contact someone who has some admired opinion and make a connection to, so that we can get to these people and get down to even more brassy tacks than we went over tonight. Prove this scientifically. The more people we can get this to over the airwaves, over television, through movies, through other books, the faster we can get it out, the better for everyone. I've been doing this for two years, and Madeline's been with me for the last year. And we've been doing this and enjoying this very much. But we can see that the pace at which things are changing is not exactly the pace that we're reaching people. And it's going to take you guys helping us out. Help yourself out. And the books are right back here. I mean, you want some more proof? We got it all. It's all written down. You have to read it, but it's all there. This is, this is not some scheme other than on the part of God. <laughs> uh, you know, please, avail yourself of the information. Please. And then turn somebody else on to it. The tapes that we're making tonight will be for sale in another couple of weeks. We request that if you buy a tape, you show it to a group of people, you ask those people who in the group would show it to others, and you make them a copy and you give it to them. Tapes will be ready in about a month. A month. Yeah, two weeks to but a month. Keep, keep checking the website because as soon as they're complete, they will be up on the website for purchase. And once you, like I said, once you buy one, have it copied as many times as it'll copy. Okay? How much are these books? The books, 25 bucks. $25. They're $24.95 at uh, Amazon.com. We charge you five cents for delivery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been on the Art Bell Show. Yeah. And I'm emailing people all the time. But you understand, I mean, you guys understand, how many talks could you go to this month? Oh, my God. Just here, you know? Imagine being Art Bell. He's got to stack this high of emails and faxes of please listen to my message. And every one of these guys, this of any value at all, is in a blizzard of messages. There's only one way this will get through. And that's by enough people talking about it. Better for sale tonight? We'll wrap one for you. No, there's no donation. Uh, you guys already paid attention. That's enough. <laughs>